public. Anyway. Glad to see you all, and um, I hope you're ready for an enthusiastically educational year coming up here. We've got all kinds of things planned. Jeb is um, has a, an event planned for the is it the 23rd of March? Well, in fact, I tell you what, though, Mr. Arger Wright. No one is going to leave here without a handout for <laughs> okay. So yes, no one. But Mr. Argerbright, among others, will be set up there. But no one leaves tonight without one in their hand. Yes. All right. Well, uh, Jeb is the resident archaeologist at the Clark Main Museum in Circleville, retired from the Ohio Historical Society slash Connection. Uh, and uh, he has been doing a super, super job of, uh, in his retirement, getting people involved in archaeology around here, and he's playing several events. He's got an, an event at the Clark May Museum coming up. He's got an event over in MacArthur coming up. Uh, we've got our own event coming up in April as well, and we're just beginning. So this should be a, a, a busy year for you to learn about any aspect of ancient society that you can think of. We're going to try to get it all going here. If you missed it the other night, I, I gave a presentation up at OUC on the Liberty Earthworks. And uh, I'm hoping to revisit that later on in the year with us locally here. So we might do that as well. But we did that as a Friends of Hope of Culture uh, sponsored event. And uh, I thought it went well. I think that there was a lot there to, to be shared. And it's already been tested, so it should be ready to go when we want to do it as a fill-in here. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Susan Nisley, our head ranger, person who organizes all kinds of things out here, <laughs> trains staff, hires staff, keeps the superintendent in line, and she's going to open things up for us. Yeah. Welcome, everybody, to the first of your uh, sessions for this 2024 season. I am... Susan Nisley, I'm the Director of Interpretation and Education here. I've been here now next month, 24 years. So I have seen quite a lot of you over the years. So most of your faces I do know. Uh, some of you, this might be your, your first time getting to do this event here at the park. Uh, so I just wanted to do a quick introduction. I know you're all here to learn about artifacts and see these wonderful things, but if there's other interests that you have, one of the events we have coming up later this month is a training for garlic mustard volunteers. <laughs> and if any of you own property in Ross County, it's one of the many weeds that we all try to keep out, and that's the case for here too. Um, once you're trained, then you can come any time or any day in the month of April, that's the prime time to pull it, and help us clear a section of our forest of that noxious weed. We have other events that we're planning for the summer. Dr. Ruby and Dr. Everhart will be doing second Friday tours in the summer. Those will be posted soon, as soon as they nail down exactly what they want to do. <laughs> uh, we will get that out on our social media, the website, other areas where you might hear about events. And if there's anything that you're interested in that you would like to see, that you're curious about, reach out to us, let us know. Dr. Ruby and I are trying to work on more lectures. I have been here for many years seeing the Harness series. The problem with that is a lot of these people have passed away. I don't know if you all have noticed, but we're getting older. And I was at, <laughs> I was at Gary's talk and he was going through all of the different Hopewell archaeologists, and it was like weeding off family members to me. I have been here with Dr. Grieber, with Dr. Lynott, with Paul Pacheco, with Deanne Weimer. They've all either passed away or retired. So what we need from you all is to start engaging the youth with your passion for this, because we need to build up new archaeologists that want to take this on so that we can fill our lives with more of these stories so it doesn't just end with these great people so that's my call to action to all of you when you leave here inspire a young person with what you're learning about today so that we can work with them and hopefully see them become a hopeful archaeologist someday i'm going to turn it over now to dr jeb 
And then if there's any of you that haven't been here for a while, I do have the bookstore open, and I'll keep it open as you all take off. And hopefully you have a lovely night and a safe evening going home. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There, I want to make sure I stand in. Where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> if I don't trip and kill myself, how's this? You're great. All right. Perfect, perfect. Anyway, uh, thank you, Susan. In fact, uh, <coughs> gave the you know perfect uh, introduction of what we're going to talk about tonight. Because uh, Adina Hopewell Studies Insights and, what's the last word? <laughs> Opportunities. Opportunities. Uh, who here, and I know that at least some of us were, were at the last uh, Hopewell Conference up at the Christopher. Yes, I know many of us were, at least some of us. Anyway, how many of us remember Dr. Mark Siemens, uh, you know, banquet talk? Uh, it was also the main point of his banquet talk. How many years ago was that, Alan? Longer than I realized, probably. Uh, ten years ago. It's been a while. Or, yeah. A while, but anyway, but uh, his final and climactic slide was of about a 10, 12-year-old girl walking through a farm field holding up a Hopewell, a Hopewell point with the light that she had just found and was getting really interested in Hopewellian studies. And as Susan said, it is it's more than critical, it's essential that we encourage others, especially youth, to become interested in archaeology in general, Hopewell archaeology in particular. <coughs> anyway, and also, uh, Mark will recognize one of his uh, points there from uh, the Franklin Valley, but as you can see, it's a broken Adina stem point. However, Besides being a broken artifact, what is it? Lord's chalcony. I'll, I'll you know, be merciful and answer Lord's. my own question. <laughs> it is an irreplaceable piece of primary data. Yes, we uh, in archaeology we you know live and die by primary data, and even though it's you know pretty well mashed. It's a wonderful piece of information, and bless Mark, immaculate provenance, so a wonderful, irreplaceable piece of primary data. So, I mean, the big flashy things are wonderful, but it's the little broken up stuff that we find around, uh, you know, that's critical to our understanding of the past. Speaking of critically understanding the past, let's see, is this the advance? <laughs> No, it's, it's going to explode. Maybe I, can I just touch the forward arrow one here? Yes, it advanced. Okay, so here we have uh, the so-called uh, turkey tails because those of you that saw some of Mr. Arger Wright's recent programs will remember they looked like the tail of a plucked turkey, kind of. And You're a pigeon. I remember that Mr. Arger Wright, the Latin teacher, gave, can you say the Latin word again? Europigium. Yes, the Europigium. Oh, plenty of room, everybody. Yeah, plenty of room. Come on in, please. Pl plenty of room. Plenty of seats left. Plenty. Plenty of seats. Anyway, these things are made out of the good old, uh, uh, as I look, what is it? Is, is that the St. Genevieve shirt, Rich? The St. Genevieve oh. flint that they called Indiana yeah, Hornstone? Yeah, St. Genevieve, yes. <coughs> and they're limestone. practically... St. Genevieve limestone. They're practically always made out of that material, and apparently, you know, there's some special thing, not made, you know, for everyday utilitarian use, but often found in caches, often pr purposely broken. This cache is uh, from out by uh, Lanaville. Okay, then... And but the distribution of these things in the world, you can see the blue dots on the uh, map on my side of the screen. So you can see all the way from the Mississippi River up to Green Bay, Wisconsin, down to the Tennessee Valley, 
and east to the Finger Lakes of New York. But as you can see, Ohio is at the very eastern end of their uh, major distribution. And although it's much, much more complex than that, yes, Rich, I do understand that. But where it says like IH for Indiana Hornstone, so-called, uh, that's one place that the St. Genevieve, uh, oh, plenty of room, guys, plenty of room. Uh, outcrops uh, so much so made out of that one material very widely distributed but uh, the one of the other pay uh, far from me is the uh, distribution of uh, these things in Ohio and the red dots are you know caches of you know multiple turkey tails in one deposit and as you can see there's two main clusters of them. One just was in Cincinnati, but where's that other main cluster? Yes. Can anybody see the map that well, I hope? Ross County. In more than Ross County, correct. More than Ross County, basically, is the Paint Valley. Yes, the Paint Valley. Very, so, I mean, something special was going on in the Paint, in the Paint Valley, you know, about 3,000 years ago. And I, I, I should have mentioned this is meant to be a discussion too, so if anybody has some dad, just raise your just raise your hand, please, and break the monotony of uh, me talking. Anyway, I bet most of us, if not all of us, are familiar, you know, with the old fox farm up on North Bridge Street. In fact, uh, those of us that are older remember when it was out in the country. But it's not anymore. No. <laughs> Fox Farm has been engulfed by urbanism. Anyway, uh, it's just, uh, you know, that way across the <coughs> river. And these, uh, and uh, where's my wife Pam? Where'd she go? Yeah. Wave, Pam. Th that's my wife Pam there that uh, studies geology in a very, and fossils in a major way. And, uh, when I recorded that specimen from the Fox Farm, didn't have a camera with me, but many of these are made uh, of this type of two of uh, whatever they are, are made out of the uh, nice. And, and there's some nice from Wyoming, right, Pam? Yeah. From Wyoming, very beautiful stone that polishes up nice. But they're off there, the same age as the turkey tails, about 3,000 years old, a little bit less. And uh, the yellow dots on this side are the uh, bar omelets made out of nice. And again, where's the major concentration of them? Here, right? And then going down to Sayota, as Mr. Sanders says, rightly so. In fact, on, on the other side, you know, there we, we circle it. Uh, the Ross County area is certainly... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, does anyone but me old enough to remember the, the, the big Atoodle farm? I know you are, Barney, and some of the rest of us, on the Ross Pickway County line on the uh, west side of the river. Uh, the, uh, the, de uh, the dentist, Dr. Toodle, his grandpa found one of those bar omelets made out of nice. And... Uh, on their farm on the river at the county line, Ross Pickwick County line, but it was broken because he saw it working the ground with horses and he saw the horse step on it. He saw the horse break it with its shoe, but he got both of the pieces. Anyway, let's move right. Okay. Hey, Jerry, yeah. Yes, break the monotony, please. You said ask questions at will. Want to go back? On this Toodle farm, did they find any turkey tails? No. No. Okay. So, the, but the reason I'm raising that question is because there was a cache of turkey tails found over near Bourneville. Yes, sir. And amongst those turkey tails was a worked piece of nice, but it wasn't a bar amulet. Oh, a nice piece of nice, a so nice, to speak. A very nice piece. Of nice. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, there so there I'm were not. Sure. But but again, to show if. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, the dentist's grandfather had been deceased and I was working with a collection, I would have made a wrong assumption because, you know, a real nice farm collection, but a great big 
you know, a blue-gray flint disc identical to the ones found by Moorhead at the Hopewell site. And I said, whoa, you know, look at this. I've got two. Is this from the farm? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, what's it doing in your farm collection? And he says, well, don't you know, he says, my grandpa, I mean, you know, the, the dentist grandpa's grandpa in the 1890s was, uh, was big in, uh, you know, Ross County politics and uh, was out there visiting. And he says, Moorhead gave one to my grandpa as a souvenir. Hmm. But if Grandpa Toodle had been deceased, I'd have seen it in the farm collection and said, oh my golly, they're distributed up here. Hmm. So... I guess the note they say, you know what, you make me when you're assume me, right? Mm -hmm. Don't assume. You got two of them, Barney? I got three. Three? More than two. And, oh, and they were found in Pinkway County. Very good. Very good, Barney. Then moving right along. I got one turkey tail. And a turkey tail. But it's not made of Nordstone. But not hornstone. It, yeah, it is hornstone, no. but not your regular hornstone. A different kind. But moving right along, you can see uh, one of Mr. Perkins' uh, uh, Kramer points, but that are uh, from like the earliest pottery times, uh, uh, often the so you know the Marian culture, hmm. and right before what we might really know as Clascadine around here. And there's uh, that point is kind of uh, behind the. Uh, the old uh, Liberty Township School that used to, that they made into a uh, made into a restaurant for a while in a truck stop out in Old Thirty Five in Liberty Township. Strangely enough, Liberty Township School it'd be Liberty Township, wouldn't it? Imagine that. Anyway, but when I was at the old Ohio Historical Society as a senior research associate, uh, put very far away in storage, I found a bag that was marked. Uh, that was marked uh, Albert Spettenagel, 1930. Opened it up in several pieces. There was that base of a 2,800-year-old uh, Marian thick pottery vessel. And it, it, the flat base, you can see they had made it on a mat. And there's the impressions of the woven mat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was found just uh, at the northern edge of the Pickway Plains bottom, just behind the DuPont plant. Mm -hmm. Yes, just behind the DuPont plant. Okay, and another Kramer point. Yes, found by uh, one of our friends in the room here. And uh, this one's out on, uh, out on the uh, middle part of Civil Creek. But there are the, uh, I won't uh, dwell on this because we don't really have time to. And anyone that's introduced interest in these distribution maps, I just email any you know, anything you want to you anyway, but here's the distribution of, uh, and I'll ask Mr. Argerbright, where's the main concentration of these Kramer points? An area you're kind of familiar with? <laughs> you always ask me these questions that are so obvious that I never know what you're expecting. <laughs> well, but I mean, who, uh, what, what program did you give just the other? Well, Liberty Township. Yes, I mean, they're, uh, but, but, but again, uh, can, can you say briefly, Gary, how that's such a special area there with those terraces at the yeah. interface? And yeah, real quickly. It's a very special area. Real certainly. quickly, the Wisconsin and Glacier created an, the highest terrace there to the uh, east side of the Scioto, and it's about a five and a half mile long terrace that's just a little bit of a rolling terrace that sits at about, sits at about a 620 to 630 foot elevation, and then it slopes down to uh, some middle terraces, and then there's uh, one terrace that, that in, appears in several places in the bottoms along that terrace. And then you, uh, at 565 foot elevation, you've got the bottomlands there. And so it's just this marvelous environment of different uh, biospheres, basically, or uh, biomes, uh, because of all <coughs> this different terrain there. Then you've got the same thing in Lewis. Oh, please. Uh, Kramer, 2,500 years, is that 2,500 BCE or 2,500 years 2,500 years ago. Years ago. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Years ago. Years ago. Anyway, let's, uh, oh, and, uh, okay, now, different folks, I've warned most of you, I'm going to be uh, 
you know, calling on for several important things here because one of the most important uh, words in successful study of the past, although our argued successful study of anything, is uh, cooperation. So several folks from several different institutions and programs, you know, I want to, uh, you know, just call on so they'll be recognized and after the program, you know, we can talk with those uh, folks then, if you like. Of course, uh, you know, Susan has already given, you know, a great introduction to the, you know, to the National Park here, so I don't need to uh, do that again, but, but here we have my boss, the president of the uh, Pickley County Historical Society, could, could you wave, Jane, and those interested in the Pickway County Historical Society learning more about it can ask uh, Jane after the program, and also, nobody is, among other things, because we'll be getting there, but among other things, Nobody is leaving here uh, <laughs> without uh, a, a flyer of, of the museum and how to get in contact with us, how to schedule, you know, a tour and all this and, and all that. And as I always tell folks, even if you might go to the museum all the time already, take a flyer and give it to somebody that hasn't been. Yes. Anyway, uh, Adina culture. Uh, the first uh, of the you know real famous <coughs> classic bell builders around here, uh, he wasn't able to make it this evening. But uh, Dick McClish uh, has just donated a, a huge co collection of prehistoric artifacts to the Cl Pickway County Historical Society's Clark May Museum in Circleville, and uh, his collection is from up by Frank Road by the old trash burning power plant in Columbus, and also from uh, their family farm just south of Grove City. But what's happened to Grove City in the last 50 years? Progress. It exploded, right? Grove City has exploded. Uh, so you're not going to be looking for artifacts anymore. To, I mean, prehistoric, plenty of modern artifacts but prehistoric artifacts around Grove City anymore. But uh, Mr. McClish, although uh, on a smaller scale, numbered his fields just like Robert Lee Harness Jr. And just immaculate, wonderful, and he collected everything, and just a wonderful collection of very high research value. And uh, they're about, again, these things are about 2,300 years old. The Adina culture can see two of the stem points. The uh, one on the far side reworked into a scraper, but uh, what are what what are the two things that look like mud off your tire or mud off your shoe over there? <laughs> Outside, uh, gog. Those, yeah, that that's how the ancient pottery looks in the real world. Not always spectacular. Looks like something that was caked on your boot there, but that's good old uh, Adina plain uh, pottery. And, okay, uh, and as we said, here are, here's a nice uh, Claude White's picture of uh, uh, an Adina mound at the south end of, uh, of Jackson in the, in the cemetery. And, yes, the first mound builders in this area, the Adina. <clears throat> Named after, why do we call it Adina? I know we have at least one former Adina volunteer here, my wife. The Adina Mansion, because the Adina Mound that they found on Worthington's property, but they excavated it in, what, 1901, with the stipulation that after they tore it down, they would dispose of the dirt so they could farm it. And now it's a street. But they did find the Adena Effigy Man, our state artifact, and it's made out of Scioto County Pipestone. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm. oh, Mr. Argerbright was fixing to say something, I think. I was going to add to what Pam was saying. Actually, the man who owned the land at the time that it was excavated stipulated that they couldn't totally level the mound. Mm -hmm. They had to leave a trace of it. And that's why, am I spoiling what you're going to do? Not at all. You're helping. That's why. When I you, wanted you to, yeah, thank you, sir. When you drive uh, northwest on Orange Street, 
yeah. the street goes up like this and then back down, yeah. you're actually driving over what's left of that, that uh, piece of the land. And, and again, to emphasize, we call these cultures, you know, but they're not synonymous with tribes or ethnic groups. They're like groups of artifacts that we think kind of hang together, and us archaeologists just give them arbitrary names. So we call it the Adena culture, but as Gary very nearly mentioned, and might have mentioned, but I will uh, call it the Adena because it used to be the Adena state, estate, but Mr. Froelich owned the mound at the time, so we could be talking about Froelich studies just as well. Or as my wife Pam loves to say, it, this could be, right, the Clark National Park, among other names. It could be the Clark, uh, Clark National Historic Park, too. But, you know, I mean, all arbitrary. All arbitrary. Speaking of arbitrary, oh, yeah, let's, uh, okay, let's move on. No, but still Adina. The, the one on this side is the generalized distribution of what we call the Adena mounds in the world. In other words, mounds about uh, 2400 to about 1900 years old that have what we define as Adena artifacts in them, but we'll get into a minute. And on the far side here, you can see the distribution of uh, such mounds in Ohio. Do we know they followed the 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 different rivers? You can really pick that out, can't you, Barney? Yeah. You can really, really pick that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Then the one on uh, my side is Columbus is at the very top of the map. There's Portsmouth. Uh, there's Brown County. And uh, you can see the mouth of the Kanawha River at the southeast edge of the map. And uh, you can see Buckeye Lake in the northeast part of the map. And there's their distribution of uh, at least what we suggest might be the mounds in this, uh, in this area. And there's another typical thought to be a Dina Mound uh, on Ohio Brush Creek in Adams County. Rodney Riggs took the picture. And again, you can see the rise in the field, but it's not spectacular. But notice I said thought to be a Dina Mounds. I mean, that thought part is important because we really don't know. If all of these were actually verified, or try to be verified, the distribution might be different. Because what happens when you assume, right? <laughs> they always say, don't assume. So what do archaeologists like me do all the time? We assume. Well, yes, a little bump, so it must be an Adina Mound, I suppose. Yes. A harsh truth, but it's still true. We do that, us archies. Okay. Uh, one of Rich Walker's nice Adina stem points. Uh, from Vinton County, and on the, the map is the distribution of Adena stem points in Ohio. But does anyone notice what the distribution of Adena stem points does not correlate to at all? Mounds. That's right, it doesn't correlate at all with the distribution of Adena mounds, not at all. And in fact, uh, in the northern, north central Ohio, you can see kind of two linear concentrations. Uh, the southern one is, does anybody know what's in that part of north central Ohio? The, the hint is, part goes to the Gulf of Mexico, part goes to the St. Lawrence. What do we call that boundary? The Continental Divide. The Continental Divide. In other words, the high ground between the major drainages, that's what the end and the one uh, uh, a little bit to the north of that, that linear concentration, is the, uh, the high ground overlooking Lake Erie. Not the shore, but the higher ground overlooking. May I ask a question, please? Please, have mercy and ask a question. <laughs> People get tired of hearing me. When I ask a question, you may beg for mercy. Uh, That's the whole like, critical thinking, right? Critical thinking. The two 
east-west patterns, do either of them correlate with the ancient beach fronts? Yes. The northern one does. Northern one does. Am I right in that, Randy? The, the northern the beach one? Beach ridges? Yeah. Yes. Like the highest. Let me put it this way, in the Lake Erie drainage area close to the lake, if it is higher, it's a beach ridge. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that know of Randy, Randy is a former DNR person, very much studied such things. So the answer is the first one, yes, but the lakes never got as far as the continental divide. But the first one would have been the edge of the very uh, the highest glacial lake level. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> wow, absolutely so. so uh, oh, please. What, yeah. Back, what back, does back. That, what does that tell us about their use? Well, <laughs> the scary thing is, and somebody better remember this because in every program I've given for the last forty years, well, I always say what are on our you know I'm not being I, I'm not I'm not trying to be facetious I'm deadly serious when I say this what's an archaeologist three favorite words I don't know that's right I mean if we're honest we don't know and we're studying that as hard as we can but at the present time we don't know but Randy has something to say I probably please. guess it's ground that wasn't wet all the time beach front property well they didn't Indians didn't like to get flooded you know, where we saw so, stuff on yeah. higher ground. It was very swampy and wet over a lot of Ohio, with low ground. Yeah, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a history teacher. And I'm, I'm just speculating as I look at that. Is it related? Did they use that point in relation to fishing and fish? I mean, if there's water everywhere. In I mean, yeah. Well, maybe not standing water, but... You know, high grit wetland, as we would define a wetland. Would there have been lakes, though, at that time? Small well, lakes? <coughs> you have wet areas, and Ohio yeah. used to have a lot of springs and groundwater and stayed swampy and wet, and people lived on higher ground, like like Emmett Road in Waverly. White people moved down to the Cider River floodplain to get away from malaria and everything else. Have we found those points, uh, for instance, with animal bones and so forth do we associate well but the thing is we don't a certain speak type of hunting no. or what do we say? I mean deposits that old I mean although it happens finding animal remains in a settlement of that age is extremely rare we'll get you Barney so we don't we'll get know you. what they're I mean but the thing is we need a way to test this and the data at hand don't allow that to be tested yet yeah, but you heard me say the word yet. So hopefully we'll get greater samples, have greater methodologies where we can test that. But but right now, we cannot test that at the data with hand. I would just say hurry up because I'm very old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Barney was about to fix it to say something. Yeah, but we'll get you there, Randy. Barney was to say something. I wanted to add on something, oh. Dr. Barney. Okay, most of your points are used as tools. They're also made basic dives. They're used for all purposes. So you don't have to worry about, we weren't back there then. <clears throat> so you can't say they were just for honey. You can also use them for doing manufacturing and other things besides I mean, honey. Uh, to build on what Barney's saying, I mean, you know, in common talk, I say, oh, look, you got some arrowheads. But I don't even mean arrowheads, of course. And I don't even mean projectile points. <laughs> I mean, there may you have some prehistoric flake stone artifacts I used for a host of things. But, you know, just in common slang, I but arrowhead is a slang term and, and very misleading because as Barney says... I think 90% were nice. I, I do too, yeah. Barney. I certainly do too. So cents are going to add. I do too. Randy, look, please. Look at just left going... Um, from northeast to southwest. Hey, Look at that see. big area with no points or anything. That was the black swamp. Oh yeah, the great black swamp oh, there. The great that. black yeah. swamp. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. No one lived in there. I, I mean, and you can see the banks the Maumee to find through there, right? Right. But away from the Maumee, right. you just don't. Maumee well, had swamps in it too. <laughs> there were a lot of swamps in Ohio. But, but I mean, the, 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 the great black swamp is really defined there, isn't it? It is really defined. And uh, 
Is your Streams of Ohio still available, Randy? Limited copies, if you know the right person. I mean, you can't <laughs> no, get it right it's, from, it's down a print. It's out of print from DNR, print print though. And the you, guy you, can't, the, you can't download a copy from the, the website. The guy that did yeah. the artwork for the fish, oh. it just threw a hissy fit. So the answer is no. Right. Okay. Made, made DNR take it off their website, sued them oh. and everything. But anyway, we are uh, honored with the author of the Streams of Ohio here. and uh, But again, through cooperation, look, look at what studies we can do. Speaking of cooperation, Mr. Flint well, and Mr. Look, Geology. Look at this map. You can see the uh, Hawking Valley. Got, uh, yes, look uh, at the Hawking there. It shows up really uh, bright. The yeah, and, and, uh, going down to the horse's land forms there. <coughs> you can really see the diagonal and, Hawking. Can't and the Scioto shows up really well. Yes, it does. Especially on the southern end right there. Yes, it does. Now, if you notice, connecting the two, there's a whole bunch of stuff in between the two. They're totally connected. That is your Flint area in, in the eastern portion of southern Ohio. That's Benton County, and well, you see that black glob down there headed towards Lawrence County. That's your Brush Creek area. But yeah. what about Tarleton, Ohio? What's that? Tarleton, Ohio, where Tar Hollow is at. Tar Hollow. Mm-hmm. It's in Pickaway uh, County, Pickaway well, County. There's Florida. not that well, much plant in Tar Hollow. What about rounding by the mounds? Well, that's, that's a that's headwater. Well, there's a lot of mounds there on Salt Creek. Yeah. 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 But you, you're on a corridor valley headed towards Benton County where all the plants are. Okay. So you're on a trail headed towards the plant area. I can remember when I was a kid, I used to find a lot. All down through there. Yeah. Yeah. I found in that area myself. They're okay then. Whose property is this for Mr. Arger write a whole bunch of Adina stem points? <laughs> Harness? Yes, the Robert Lee Harness Jr. in that same uh, area in Liberty Township along the Selda River that uh, I just uh, couldn't help but, you know, have these things in honor of Gary here. So is Harness's whole farm 888? No. No. How, okay. how many localities did, does, Multiple. how many different okay. fields did Bob have? Bob uh, 45. Okay. So there's 45 okay. trinomial numbers at least okay. on Bob's farm. At least 45. Okay. At least 45. And from uh, even some more, uh, from another site uh, behind the old Liberty Township School too. So very many in that landform that and Gary was talking that's about. That's part of that upper that's terrace. Yes, a very special landform as Mr. Argerbright emphasizes. Okay, speaking of landforms, but not really. Uh, didn't have any good photographs of these, so we have to make do with my drawings. So, uh, so Adena culture, we call them gorgets. Who knows what they were really made for? You can see the bike concave at my end, the cod concave in the middle, expanded center on the forend, three different times of Adena period gorgets, and the distributions. Bike concave here, quadra concave in the middle, expanded center on the end. Again, what do they not correlate with, these so-called Adena gorgets? Can you say it again? Yes, they don't. They don't. Uh, Correlate with the Dina culture is defined. They, they just don't correlate with it at, at all. In fact, uh, they drill one side. The, absolutely. <coughs> but do you remember, Randy, if that was like Middle Bass or North Bass Island, where it was the manufacturing center for those quantum concave gorgets? Oh, you the, got me. I have no idea. But That's either me. Middle Bass or North Bass Island in Lake Erie, uh, there were like four, there were 20 of them Never found. Heard of that broken in manufacture. So these things were manufactured way out of the usual Adena area, and again, a research opportunity. Okay, come on. Ro the Robbins culture, or late Adena if you prefer, from about 200 BC to about the year 100, uh, this is Riches from Elk Fork uh, in Vinton County, a nice big van port, in, in this case, do you think from Flint Ridge or not, Rich? Uh, or not necessarily? Probably. 
Uh, my came from a ridge. Uh, but there's Vanport in Benton County and Jackson County that's just as good a quality. Because as Rich taught me, and this is a very important point, he says, just don't say, oh, it's, just don't say, oh, yeah, it's Flint Ridge Flint, because Flint Ridge is a place, Vanport is the geological, uh, material. The geological material. And, uh, or just like, you know, how many of us might say, oh, yeah, that's Upper Mercer Flint, that's Coshocton. Some of it is, but as Rich taught me, more of it will be from the good old Vinton, greater Vinton Jackson County. I mean, how thick are some of those Upper Mercer deposits that you've worked uh, actually, with? Actually, the Benton County stuff's kind of thin. But didn't you say some are tremendously... Uh, oh, the Benport is. Uh, Benport on, uh, in Milton Township in Jackson yeah. County is as thick as the limestone below it, which is it, considered half, half in, in of fact, the sea truly, is, is flint, which is five, six foot I, I mean, Thanks. truly, the reason when people see Vanport Flint, Formation Flint, people think of Flint Ridge because Flint Ridge, you know, has a nice state park right there. But you got four or five feet of Flint in Jackson County. But if there was a similar park in Jackson County, people would be calling it Jackson County Flint instead. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's my Flint sermon for this evening. We won't, we won't repeat another Flint sermon. I'll, I'll can it there, folks. And, Oh, but anyway, quickly, these Van Force Robbins blades, uh, the distribution, again, although they're considered Robbins Adena, what do they not correlate with? Distribution of Adena mounds again. No correlation at all. And uh, you can see uh, uh, in the Flint Ridge area, you, the FR, you can see a big cluster of them. But look at the cluster right around us, too. Yeah, look at that, a huge cluster right around us. So something, you know, special continues to happen right here. That dates back at least to the turkey tail times 3,000 years ago. And the, uh, some, didn't I hear, I was in the conversation, but weren't some of us talking about the blocked in two pipes this evening and how you didn't draw the smoky material into your, into your mouth? And, and here's one of them. These things are uh, about 2,000 years old. And But look at the distribution. Uh, Ohio is on the very western edge of the distribution of these things. You can see they go all the way up to the maritime provinces of Canada, uh, all the way up to Massachusetts, to Long Island, to a Chesapeake Bay. So... We call these things Adena Robins, but again, no correlation with distribution of the Adena culture. And uh, you can see we're at the very southwestern edge of the distribution of these things. We're not in the heartland of their distribution by far. Uh, I can't help but this one up here is from Tymock Creek in western Wyandotte County. Uh, a man I know was about 30 years ago now was out walking his dog around the Tymock Creek, and he saw the end of a plastic, you know, he thought was, you know, like a plastic, uh, well, what do you call them? Not, not a tube, but, you know, that coils up. Uh, what do people use that stuff for? You mean for pop cans? Like, not like a hose, almost. But, you know, about so big. I've seen them used in farming operations for maybe for, like, almost like a small tile or something. Anyway, he saw it sticking out of the ground, that that black you know that plastic thing so he kicked it and up flew that pipe stone blocked in tubular pipe flew right up in the air when he kicked it and hydraulic and he, he broke it right he broke it right in half but still but still if he hadn't kicked it he wouldn't have found it yes and okay uh, didn't have a picture handy, but I'm sure all of us are familiar with the wonderful Hopewell platform so-called monitor effigy pipes, uh, you know, that so many were found, you know, in one mound just a few, you know, tens of yards away from us over here. And 
but look at the distribution of, uh, of those things. Uh, so many were found at Mound City right here, the MC. So many were found at Tremper, marked by a G. But again, look, we're at the very edge of the distribution of these things. This time, the eastern edge of the distribution. So, I don't know what it means, but the western edge of the block, the people that made the blocked-in tubes comes this far. <coughs> the eastern edge of the Hopewell effigy platform pipes comes this far. So, it looks like maybe where two whole world views or something met or something, or ethnic groups, I don't know, but <coughs> one ponders what that means. But it's time to move on and not to ponder. One of Mr. Perkins again, from out by Richmondale, uh, a Ra uh, Robbins Point, again about 2,000 years old. And again, they're, you know, they're called Robbins and Nina, but what does their distribution definitely not correlate with again? The distribution of Adena mounds as we define them. So, uh, again, this just shows all the more the cultures that us archaeologists make up more than a product of past human behavior, many of them are products of the archaeologist minds. And you know, uh, you know, useful to talk about, you know, was a easy way to, you know, talk about the past, but you don't want to start confusing them with necessarily ethnic groups or anything. Please save us, Adam. Say something. Say, get me out of this. Well, I'll get you deeper. <laughs> in terms of these not being associated with Matt, Adina, Matt, yeah. so to speak, in the corner that screen says shows only points not found in mounds. Yes, correct. So, so that data that seems kind of irrelevant. But yeah. okay, but yes. Uh, now in the but again, you'd have no way of knowing this because they didn't present that information. Uh, the points, no points have been found. Uh, they're usually, well, in fact, they aren't found in mounds north of that mound, uh, north of the area that shows the edge of the mounds. So they are found in mounds south of they the They are, area. in number. Okay. In number. Okay. I mean, like, how many around here, Mr. Gary? I mean, well, we have the, uh, well, we just, I won't take time now, but we start naming the famous Nita Mounds here, many Robbins points. Okay. Many so they, Robbins blades. Gotcha. So they are found in mounds. Yeah, oh, yes, okay. they are. Okay. But and even everyday ones, not just the exotic. Yeah, but the, like you say, just the almost used up versions of them were found in the barrel. In fact, there's a real nice uh, at the old Ohio Historical Society, the Ohio History Connection now, uh, from the Adena Mound. A real, uh, I've really not seen a picture anywhere, but a real nice looks like a, like a, a toolkit of Adena stem points, and it was all found wrapped up together. And they're just all, you know, beat up, abused, and wore down, and sharpened down to nothing. Like, but the scary thing is, they were found in one little bundle. But some are Robin's points, some are Adina points, that should be from two different time periods. But they're not. It shows the weakness of our archaeological thinking many times. Could it be, just throwing this out here for everybody. Sure, thank that you. That the hafting system, which is how the bases are de designed, and that's how archaeologists identify the different point types. Could it be that the hafting system was very useful to a large span of people covering all of the state or all these parts of the state, whereas not everybody bought into the mound building phase? And there's no way to think that everybody's speaking an Adena language or dressing in an Adena dress code. You know, these are different people that are using the same technological tool hafting system. I mean, and as you say, Gary, that's true for about all time periods, isn't it? Yes. I mean, you just name your point type, it's going to be found over huge parts of the continent, right? Right. I think and they proved that on yeah. the Bridge Street Mound. On your the, Bridge Street Mound where you guys suffered so in that Hope cold well, weather. Extreme suffering. Yeah. Hope well and both. Yes, extreme in place of... <laughs> of suffering in the cold weather. Yeah, but I, I want to say something. No, please, Rich, yes. Uh, Rich. Yes, you might find uh, uh, all these mounds down in the southern part, but there in that northern part, 
there is still a few mounts. And yes, there are, absolutely. There what may not be as plentiful, but they're but still there's there. Some, absolutely. They're still there. <coughs> and that's, that's all I, mean, I want they to are, say. I mean, and I mean, and I mean, that's the danger, one of the many dangers of archaeology. And if we're honest, none of, I'll talk about myself, I won't drag anybody else down the drain, but many of us are, at least, and I'm guilty of this, we call it circular reasoning. We say, we define, uh, we define culture X in this area, okay? I find something outside of the area I define culture X in. Therefore, it's not culture X. But that's a product of my own mind, right? I mean, circular reasoning. And archaeological reasoning is, well, to be honest, it's often uh, logistically, I mean, uh, yeah, logically, not logistically, that's moving the materials. It's often, archaeological reasoning is often logically invalid. It is, if I want to be honest about it. It's often invalid logically. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, I have to be honest about it because it's true. It's often not a valid logical argument. Yes. Okay, then real quick, moving on here. We have the Adena culture, uh, Adena keyhole, so-called pendants on my side the late Hopewell pentagonal pendants on that side. Distributions. Yeah, I brought some. Ah, so Mr. Check those out afterwards so you'll know. Mr. Barney brought them with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barney. But anyway, and again, no, the keyhole pendants do cluster in, in the classic Adena area of southwestern Ohio. Uh, it is kind of interesting Look, through the middle axis of Ohio, kind of like the old Sandusky Saddle Trail, Sandusky Saddle Corridor, look how those pentagonal pendants kind of define that, the Sandusky Saddle Trail or, or a river corridor. <coughs> kind of interesting. Okay, our friend the Hopewell Bladelets. Uh, again, these things about 2,000 to 1,600 years old. Uh, struck off of uh, struck off of, of the uh, the core, and there's the bladelets. Uh, these are from Joe Schneider's collection. You can come and see them at the Clark May Museum. Uh, found in the Lower Pickway Plains, this uh, just uh, you know kind of near the uh, <laughs> uh, Longestelle River near the Dupont plant, just south of Circleville, and. Uh, I do, you know, have to admit, I picked out the prettiest ones in the collection. Most of them are nowhere near this colorful. I mean, it kind of reminds me real quickly, uh, when I was in uh, high school, we had a foreign exchange student from Argentina. And one time in study hall, he says, Jim, I have kind of a private question to ask you. And it kind of scared me, I thought it was going to have to be something really embarrassing. But he says, where are all the regular people? I says, well, what do you mean by regular people? <coughs> he says, in Argentina, we see the American movies, no. we see the American magazines, and nobody looks like that. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, these are kind of high fashion models and movie stars. I said, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but what you see is regular people. And these are like the movie stars of the, of, you know, the Hopewell Cores and Bladelets. Uh, most of them, they're very wonderful artifacts, but are usually, you know, like, you know, like white or something. But so the, these are the most gorgeous in the collection. But anyway, these are one of the main things by which we define Hopewell culture. And, okay. Uh, you can see the distribution of these uh, prismatic bladelets in Ohio here. <coughs> you can see up around the Flint Ridge, so many workshops. Uh, a a work, workshop at uh, Fort Ancient, workshop at the Turner Works, east of Cincinnati. 
Uh, here we have a workshop, say that Harvey. Robert Lee Harness Jr.'s fact, property in Liberty Township. In fact, Bob believes he found three different workshops, specifically <laughs> just tons of the cores and, and thousands of broken. I mean, that's it because on, on this scale of map, you know, the, the one uh, thing covers like two townships. But how, how many cores on Bob's property do you think could be accounted for, Gary? Something like 400. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hundreds, right? Hundreds. Hundreds. Joe bring back <coughs> five gallon buckets full. Yeah, I mean just hundreds. He's got thousands. Hundreds. And then uh, around, uh, not on uh, Spruce Hill, but below Spruce Hill, and by the Bourneville Works, humongous uh, core sites. <coughs> and also another one uh, by the old Seal Works uh, south of a Piketon. And hello, Pam. And my, my poor wife Pam there, every time we're going south of 23 south of Piketon, I get so excited because right before we get to Salem County, I say, oh, oh, look here, look here. See all those tank trucks parked? That's the great big bladelet site. I mean the great big core site. Yeah, that's the big core site. It's been graveled over and used to park the tank trucks on now. And Pam always says we ought to ask him to dig there. And I say, well, I would. But I'm afraid they'd say yes. And then what would I do? I mean, you get it's today. probably slightly packed with all those trucks, all those semis parking on it. And I'd be afraid they'd say yes, and then, then I'd have to do something. But I get so excited when I see that. that uh, so when you're on south of 23, on the east side of 23, almost to Pike County, You'll, you'll see an area with a bunch, right along the road with a bunch of tank trucks parked. That'll be the uh, this blade of production site here. And you can see the same thing in, in close up, uh, in close up there. Okay. Jim? Sir? Just for the people that came in late. Oh, oh yes. I did. Very bring, important. Very important. I don't think Barney had any of these, but... And I didn't bring Come up and see these. These are what the bladelets look like, and you can see the variety of the colors. Color stuff. I thought. Thank you. Yeah. We left a spot for them. Looky there, yes. <laughs> but thank you, Gary. Continue. Thank you. Okie doke. So, okay. Uh, so, moving right along, uh, the black dots are some of the more prominent and large Hopewell, Hopewellian earthworks, about 2,000 years old. N.K. Newark. Y.T. Yost, M.A. Marietta, what C.V.? Have everybody heard of a place north of here that's called Round Town? Yeah. <laughs> Bet they have. Anyway, then you can see the ones around Ross County here. The S.L. down there is Seal. <coughs> then the T.P. is uh, Tremper. And the P.M. is Portsmouth. Uh, the A.X. just south edge of Dayton is, what do they call that, one out in Xanderville? Or... If Jeff Wilson was here, he'd know the name by heart. And uh, the Stubbs Earthworks, Milford, Turner. But in the area outlined by yellow from Flintridge to Circleville, all kinds of, you know, bladelet production sites. Uh, you can see the one uh, in Liberty Township, but Bob Harness's old place uh, circled. The, the one at Bourneville circled. The one at the seal work by the tank truck circled. The one at Stubbs Worker, the one at Tur Turner cir circled. And then the asterisk is another one uh, out by, uh, help me, Alan, where did Beulah Park used to be? Where that Walmart was going in? That, and you and Rose Sean, City. everybody worked? No City. Yeah. Well, what's Rose the City. name of that? That's terrible. I don't know. And, and, and Sean and ASC worked there. Yeah, there was a Walmart going in there. It's where Beulah Park Racetrack used to be. Grove City. Grove City. But just west of Grove City. Uh, anyway, but there's also a bladelet concentration, I mean a core concentration there. I don't remember anyway, so don't feel bad. Please, help us. In terms of the bladelets, so like most of them are made with Flint Ridge, but was a significant amount made with hornstone? I'm glad you asked that. The perfect so-called segue to the next. Yes, thank you, Adam. 
Like I gave you a quarter to say that, right? <laughs> you can't. I gave you a quarter to say that. <laughs> oh, just quickly, what's uh, that goes from Newark, to kind of around Hopeton? But what's that? Is that gray? What's that kind of gray line? The Hopewell. Road. Think of Dr. Lepper. Is it the Hopewell Road? Road? Yes. Dr. Lepper's hypothesized Great Hopewell Road. Yes. Yeah. Jeff, I got a question. Please, a question. please. The research I'm doing on the Fort Ancient sites for yes. my talk on Sunday. Yes. Flake knives were used by Fort Ancient culture and almost yes. all the cultures. Yes. And how would you tell the difference? I mean, maybe not Flint Ridge. Actually, material. I'll, I'll argue that those formal prismatic bladelets are are Hopewellian. Mm -hmm. The ones that, well, the ones that look like Garrett's. Yeah. And always Flint Ridge. Well, but we'll get into that. I'll just say in form, though. No, not in form. Form. No. <clears throat> but that being said, I, I forget their name, but one of uh, a student at Kent State some decades ago had a whole other paper that bladelets of other materials continued into use into Fort Ancient times. I mean, because just because us archaeologists say it's so. Doesn't mean it's so. Right. And again, critical, critical thinking like you're just you know showing now is essential. Yes, critical thinking is essential. The worst thing anybody can do is like if I say something as an archaeologist, say, oh well, then that's true. I mean, no, 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 no. That does a big disservice to archaeology. Listen with a critical ear to anything that I or any archaeologist ever says. Yes, look at the data, form your own opinion. Speaking of your own opinion, yes, Adam. I had a question um, Please. on the prismatic. What, yes. What, what, how would you define prismatic? Is it the, the, ah, the, the, occurs the, the to classic what we're ones about. are will be uh, convex on the ventral or the part toward the core. They will. Hey, hello, Kevin. There's plenty of room, Kevin. Plenty of room. Plenty of room. Uh, and and then they will have. It'll be one, two, three, uh, up and across. Yes, three, three faces. Usually three. Uh, one parallel to the back, mm -hmm. the other sloping down, like a classic prism. That's yes, sir. Okay. Like a classic prism. Thank you. Anyhow, and again, it shows there's the hypothesized Great Hopewell Road, and the yellow stars are the bladelet production centers from... You know, from uh, Flint Ridge to Circleville and the ones we've already talked about down here. Okay. Oop, I went right by Mr. Barnhart. Oh, no. I went by Mr. Barnhart's picture from the Lewis site behind the, uh, on the lower Pickway Plains of the Souter River behind the DuPont south of Circleville. Uh, three classic Hopewell points and three classic Hopewell point uh, preforms. That... Recovered by Mr. Barnhart and his father, along with a whole bunch of other material, and and I, I again, uh, I'm acutely aware. I think Barney, I think all of you, as I look across this audience, I see a whole bunch of folks I've pestered for hours and days at their homes. <laughs> I mean, till they just get you know start blinking the lights, wish I'd finally go away, and I, I mean. All the stuff I'm showing isn't stuff I've discovered. It's stuff that you folks and, and others have discovered. I'm just assembling it, organizing it, giving it right back. Uh, but it's, it's, I mean, truly, to be fair, it's, it's your work, not my work. Because, I mean, as I look across, I mean, I'm humbled over the decades. All the time you folks have, you know, spent to teach me. And, and I, I, I do. I, I appreciate it. Immensely, thank you. Okay, yeah. now, uh, okay, Flint Ridge, some of the work works at Circleville, Glenford, Yost, Newark, Rodney, on uh, by, by Great uh, Southern Shopping Center. There was the Rodney Mound, uh, built over now. There a, a low mound. There was an extended male skeleton. That had four of the classic rectangular Hopewellian uh, copper so called breastplates with it, which I know really aren't blessed plates because they're found all over the feet uh, here, there, but I mean, but very classic. And, uh, and 
snake den. Uh, Dick McClish wasn't able to be here, so on the darker side, Alan. The owners are here. Uh, oh, they are. Yeah. The bars are here. Oh, looky here. Yes. Hello, folks. I remember you now. I should look in the audience once in a while. Uh, yes. Uh, the bar, a snake den, a wonderful place. Uh, you can talk to the bars and or Alan after the event, but they've done wonderful work there. It's a wonderful uh, mound builder period mounted earthwork complex. They've preserved it in a park-like setting. They've done wonderful uh, research there. They have a wonderful, uh, oh, what's the right name, the snake, uh, the organization, the Snake Den? Preservation Society. Yes, yeah, Snake Den Preservation Society. A, a wonderful group. And, uh, I, and they have wonderful public events now and again. And I strongly urge, you know, everyone to talk to the bars and Alan afterwards that are interested in that because they have a wonderful organization, they're doing wonderful work, and, uh, and they should most certainly, you know, be encouraged and supported, yes. And you'll learn a lot by getting involved in the Snake Den Society. Yes, you will learn a whole big, uh, a whole big lot. Absolutely. You can become a member and go on special tours. And That's right. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal, and I, I heartily recommend it to everyone. Okay, Hopewell Point. This is from the Hopeton Bottom, just across the river, right here. About two thousand six hundred years old. There's the. Uh, not, there's the Hope Valley Point distribution. Again, what does it correlate with? Hopewell Mounds. And notice the, there's the, you can see the Continental Divide. You can see the high ground overlooking Lake Erie again. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going the wrong way. We need, uh, it's getting long enough. You don't need to go backwards. You're killing me. Okay. <laughs> Hoorah, there we go, Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Genevieve Church. Uh, so-called Indiana Hornstone comes in nodules. One of our friends in this room found this uh, nodule right along the river, right by here. Hopewell site. Uh, you know, very classic. And, as Adam said, okay, there is a bladelet core out of it from the Hopeton Bottom. There is a Hopewell Cornish Point made out of it from the Hopeton Bottom. There are, from Robert Lee Harness site number one, a core, some bladelets. Now, there are certain sites in Ohio where numbers of these cores, in other words, uh, major production centers out of Indiana Hornstone, the St. Genevieve Church, in bladelets were produced. Uh, the one is the uh, Whitaker site, just over the line in Indiana. The other one is the Stubbs Earthworks near Fort Ancient. Uh, going up, going northeast, the next blue dot is uh, such a center at Fort Hill. Uh, another one uh, at the Bourneville Earth, right next to the Bourneville Earthworks. Uh, Another one right here in the uh, the Ginther Mound, the Hopeton Earthworks, the Mound City Complex. Uh, another one on uh, up by Canal Winchester. And another one just uh, on Raccoon Creek, just east of uh, Granville. So yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. Thank you. And what this means, it means that further saying, research though. will show, we hope. Please. And something to consider, if you are finding bladelets that look like that, it really helps if you've still got part of the cortex on there to, to tell you for sure that that's from that St. Genevieve limestone. So much. To say what Gary says, some of the darker Delaware. Yeah. And also, and also there is some flint 
uh, some stuff that comes from Flint Ridge. I don't know if there's any Van Cleef. I, but I've seen in, some of that. In, in Vinton County or Jackson County. Uh, do you see any of that? No, there's some Brush Creek. It looks just like okay. that. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's, com it's complex. And again, I appreciate and thank everyone for that critical thinking. It hardens me because the word, if you want to disappoint me, just take what I say for fact. <laughs> I mean, truly, that'll mean I failed. I failed them. Critical thinking is essential. Speaking of critical thinking, come Randy. to think of it, I you know I mentioned that they're always made out of Flint Ridge bladeless. No, uh, Bob Converse had a couple frames of um, Delaware Chirp bladelets he had picked up in Madison County that I have. Oh, so they had used that material too. In Madison, very good. Yeah, I have some from Pickway County. Yeah. Okay, Jeb, then, just real, real quick here. Jeb, go oh. back and point out what the cortex is for people oh, who don't yes. understand. Oh, yes. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> okay. Sometimes they call these things cannonballs, although they're not. See the cortex there. Right. Go to the, the, the right one, too. Yeah. But it's around the edge, you can see. Yeah, this is, of course, the flip side of the same one. Yeah. Go to the bladelets, Jeb. And then on this one, there, 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 there. Mm -hmm. Cortex, cortex, cortex. Oh, okay. Yes. Look for that cortex. Very distinctive. Thank you, Alan. Very, very distinctive. And uh, we're almost finished. You know, we're almost finished here, thank goodness. So anyway, uh, I cheated on this one. It looks like one of the big hornstone discs from Hopewell. It's one of Joe Schneider's from, uh, from his former uh, northern farm up on Island Road north of Circleville. But uh, although it looks here, you notice there's no scale. The thing's only the size of a 50 cent piece. I blew it up so it would look like one of the hornstone discs. That's just a little point preform. But it serves. Anyway, but I, I know there's more of these. But I, I mean in Illinois. However, uh, starting in northern west central Illinois, uh, big caches of these things like were found in the, the Hopewell Works. I mean didn't Moorhead find 8,000 and some? There's that classic picture of, of Miss Hopewell standing by a thing that comes up, like to hear on her, of all these 8,000 and some discs. Please. You have to add to that. On average, each of those discs is about the size of your palm of your hand, up to almost to the tips of your fingers. They weigh about a half pound each in their finished form. And if you have over 8,000 of them found in one mound, and it, this is nothing but a cache of these blades. There were no burials associated with it. And so if you take 8,000 and multiply it by half of a, a pound each, you've got two tons. <laughs> two tons of that stone was brought in. But it didn't walk by itself, did it? <laughs> it did not walk by itself. I mean, you, I mean, that's the biggest effort to spill the amount, right? Just get it here? came there by water, too. <laughs> Think of that. I, I, I mean, that would upstream. make upstream. that would make but but upstream, upstream but that would make too. eminent sense, yeah. right? But anyway, uh, in West Central Illinois, we have humongous cache of them at Beardstown. Uh, I, I've seen a cache reported from the American Bottom near Cahokia by St. Louis, mm -hmm. and then in sub Spencer County, Indiana, on the Ohio River, the Crib Mound, as they call it, and then of course uh, the Hopewell Mound there. I Barney. got some Island Creek. I got a cache. An Island Creek? Well, who? I got a cache. And Pam and I drove right by there. Was that yeah, yesterday? We drove There's through, Island. we drove by Manchester. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was yesterday, yes. Pam and I, Manchester. we weren't on the Island Creek site, but Pam and I were at Manchester yesterday. Anyway, oh, please, please. There's, there's and then we'll get you, yeah. There's a huge cache of those at the. Natural History Museum in Chicago. Uh, yes, morning. Yes, and we absolutely. were there on the last day that they were. I'm glad you saw them. them. Yes, I'm glad you saw them. Now. I won't even comment on that. I'll spare folks that, but uh, but yes, please. Can you show on the map where the Indiana hornstone is found at? Well, may maybe by words it'd be easier. Uh, you know, R Rich can watch me here. Well, in fact, I'll let me turn the floor to Rich because he's the Flint expert, not you me. You see the, the black dot in the kind of in the middle. Yeah. And you see the high river there. Mm -hmm. That's that squiggly white line. You see it goes <laughs> beside that dot. It goes down, then it comes back up. 
And it comes to a point. Yeah. Well, <coughs> just right off to the right side of that point is where most of the Genevieve comes from. Rich is the one that taught me the little I know about Flint. So I'd be very <laughs> foolish to comment and not just ask Rich to say it in the first place rather than me and try and talk for him, yes. <coughs> I found a nodule 50 years ago in a farm field in Illinois. How big? Oh, you, you did? Well, who? Yeah, I, half of a nodule, you know, it's broken in half. How, are they, it was like this big, is that about, how big were they? How big do they get, Rich, the nodules? Uh, I don't know, but from what I've seen, especially if you've got all those pieces that came from uh, the Hopewell Mound, they were pretty good sized. Well, and here's another question. How big is, like, one of the biggest spent nagle cash ones? How long were they? Because the nodules have to be that big of the spent nagle turkey tails. How long is the biggest one? It's huge, isn't it? Yes, it's nine inches. Yeah, I, I, I bought one from Michigan that was yes. over seven inches. Well, there you go. So seven, eight, nine inches, right? Yeah. Yeah. Seven, eight, nine yeah. inches. At least a basketball. And at least not seven, eight, nine inches. inches. Yeah. Okay, now we're we're starting to conclude here, so we can all <coughs> have a sigh of relief. One other thing, but not quite yet. To help. <laughs> I meant well. So if you want to pin this down for yourself, just go to the computer, go to the internet, type in uh, county map. Indiana and look at the very southern point like Rich was saying and look for Harrison County because that's another name for this Flint that we have called Harrison County Church. Well there are a lot of hornstone from Con into In Kentucky, Kentucky too. Yeah. Is that the, the same? They call it the, uh, it's the same geological layer. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think okay. what's the common but name of that? A lot of, a lot of the Kentucky yeah. stuff kind of has a tendency to be a little more blue. Yes. Okay. Blue. Yeah. Yeah. And for someone not color. all of yeah. the Kentucky stuff is nodule form. Some of it is uh, is layered, okay. like yeah. a, a, you a, call it a seam. You call it nickname Kentucky Blue. Okay. But winding up here, uh, as we were talking, to, I think was that our last meeting at the Ross County Museum, where we went over like point typology and some of that. Okay, just a couple comments on that point evolution from. 1500 BC, 1000 BC, 800 BC to 300 BC. Uh, a continuity of stemmed points. Yeah, I won't bore you with all the different names, but I'll wait for this is over a thousand years of a stemmed point tradition around here. Okay? The trouble is, us. I always like these evolutionary things to be unilineal and simple. But they're not, are they? They never are. Then, uh, the quarter notch point tradition. 1000 BC, the year 250 or 600. Again, a period of 1600 years. There's also a uh, kind of a quarter notch point tradition too. And what does this mean and how do they relate to each other? Not going to try to answer that right now. Hmm. But food for thought. And throw in the Jack's Reef corner knots. Yes, which well, there are a lot of four if I had more room, room right behind the uh, Park Service colors, I would have had a Jack's Reef point, but ran out of room to the side. Okay. And uh, these Chesser notch points, about 1,400 years old. This is one of Mark's from uh, Vinton County, but what, but look how they follow the Souter River and then turn off into the uh, into Little Salt Creek toward the Jackson there, kind of a line there, and they're called but they're called Chester Points. Does anybody see the big cluster of them there out to the east? See a big blob of them? Mm -hmm. What spot is that? Chester Cave. Chester Cave, where they were defined. Mm -hmm. So there. In Athens County. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, okay, here's an, an opportunity for research real quick. Uh, now we're winding up with, you know, some, some questions that are within our capability of answering. 
These Chester points, the late woodland period, about 1400 years ago. What area is outlined in yellow? The paint. The paint, the paint, the classic paint valley, right? The paint valley. And what don't you see in that? No Chester. No Chester points. You just don't see them. And uh, if that late woodland Chester culture came right after Hopewell, I mean, there's lots of Chester points along the Souda, along the Souda River uh, Hopewell sites. Look at all the Hopewellian occupation in the uh, Paint Valley. At least I don't know of any late woodland sites really there. Something we need to study. Are they really not there, or just don't we just not know of them? Okay, and again, uh, well, we'll skip over this for the moment. Uh, well, that, well, actually, we won't there. That just shows the uh, opportunities for research. See that number one? kind of surrounded by green there, right above the yellow number one. That's a serpent mound. But look at all the other mounds around uh, the greater Adams County area that really need further, uh, further research. And, but, and these are probably of artifact samples from the greater Adams County area. Many of them provided by people in this, uh, in this room, so, a lot of uh, potential there. But anyway, okay, uh, many of us are familiar with the uh, Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center in uh, Portsmouth and with uh, Emily uh, that does uh, all the uh, research around the Portsmouth uh, uh, earthworks. That P is for the Portsmouth earthworks which are extensive, humongous, just uh, ex more extensive than Newark, perhaps. Yeah. T is the famous Tremper Mound. You can see it's Lucasville to Portsmouth, South Webster to Vanceburg. In this entire area, not counting what's been found in mounds, in that entire area, all the materials that we would define as Hopewellian, pottery, flint, would fit into a shoebox. Which at least to me suggests well one of two things. Either we're writing, either these folks are using other tools than what we call Hopewell up this way, or we haven't, you know, we just haven't found the locations. Like perhaps they were on some kind of landform that easily got buried. Maybe their main settlement was right in Portsmouth and has been built over. But, I mean, from this entire area, now inside the Portsmouth earthworks at the Horseshoe Mounds, there were hundreds of Van Gogh <coughs> cosmetic bladelets found, okay? Hundreds. But every place else outside the earthworks, in these all this wonderful bottomland, uh, there's maybe 20 bladelets accounted for, with people hunting very, very, very heavily, finding gobs of artifacts. Mainly Mississippi. So yes, but I mean, but why, why not? What's mm -hmm. going on? And I'd say maybe 10 hope. Ten what we define as Hopewell points have been found in that whole area. Even though it's the big extensive so-called Hopewellian works. I mean opportunity for study. And, and my wife Pam and I have been down there studying just that, but it's really kind of... Well, did the Ford Angel people just obliterate the, any trace of... They couldn't have. I mean... Oh, yeah. The way Earth has moved, and it just, I mean, it's just Fort Ancient Mecca, but why yeah. wasn't it Hopewell, too? 
I mean, I just, uh, but I mean, it, it's a big opportunity for further research, I'll suggest. Yeah. It'd be no. interesting to see if there's any uh, uh, band pour used in the triangulars, like we find I, those at harness. I will show thousands on Sunday, and there isn't one flint ridge. In fact, I'm glad you said that, because, no, th this is like the second to last slide. This is the second to last slide, so no reason to, you know, totally panic here. But, Mr. Sanders, I, and I'm going to call in a couple people just in closing here. Uh, it's random. In closing, because I'd like you to give the commercial for what you're doing in the event coming up on Sunday, please. Would, could you please, Randy? <laughs> call me crazy, but... Um, for several years, well, our farm is close to there. I was born in Ireton, got ahead relatives in Portsmouth, worked on Eagle Creek, and grew up in Cincinnati near Madisonville. But I love Fort Anchor stuff. I've collected a lot. And I love the bone beads and drilled teeth and everything else. So I didn't have a lot of that. Um, I rejoined the, the state chapter here in 2018 after buying an old collection in, from uh, Toledo and that. But... Anyway, I ended up going back to Ripley to the show there, the state line chapter, or, or the Fort Salem chapter had a show there, and all these people had these, what's that? <coughs> oh, that's candle coal pendant, effigy pendants and stuff like that. And then I ended up trying to get some artifacts that my uncle had sold. There had been a divorce in our family when I was 10 years old. We cut off that whole side of the family. He was principal of Portsmouth High School. Later on, I find out he had a huge collection. Um, <coughs> ended up getting sold at a yard sale and some things like that. So I've been trying to buy back some of that and meeting these people from <coughs> Portsmouth and Cincinnati and that. And I started acquiring some, and it's like, oh, what's this place called? I had to laugh, Fox Farm. I thought you were talking about the, <laughs> oh, not for, not your Lick, Fox Farm the Maze not. Lick site. Th this is... Just across the river yeah. here. So I went back and started downloading and buying old copies of the of the hundred year old publications from these famous a handful of famous um, Fort Ancient site, Harden especially. And then of course my friend Jebo had dug it uh, Furt and I got some midden stuff from him. So anyway, I've just fallen in love with it, trying to do a lot of the research and you know, just the beauty of the frames, but the culture, the people, the Ohio River is, is my favorite stream in the whole region. And I, I've gone back and done a lot of research on what it was like 300 years ago. So I'm going to paint a picture of that and talk about the cluster of the, all those Fort Ancient people along the river. 10.30 Sunday at the State Show, uh, McCoy Center, it's free. And uh, after uh, Randy can give anybody, yeah. and he can... I'm going to start. He can tell you the website to look it up on. I'm going to start by saying this is a 45 minute talk. If anybody wants a two to five hour version, let's get together. So <laughs> that's and, uh, how much material. And, and just quickly, your, and uh, your, we're, we're totally going to no, no, okay. this is the last picture. Wait a minute. Where oh, please, place? please. Hilliard. Okay, you're you're just on. north of. So this um, is on Portsmouth and Hilliard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? Well, about, the, let me give you the title of the talk. It's called Fort Ancient Bone, Shell, and Flint Artifacts from the Middle Ohio River Valley. It will be Madison, or, uh, Hamilton County to Gallia County stretch, both sides of the river, is, is the study area. But the talk is in Hilliard. Yes. At the meeting. At what time? It's a you, state you archaeological society. So the Archaeological Society of Ohio, the state, one of the state meetings. Um, the talk is at 1030. And uh, Gary, is is it too early to talk about your other upcoming? I, I will mention that. I'll close things up if you don't. Care. Oh, certainly. Uh, good, just so we don't, you know, leave you out there. That's important. And uh, ah, okay. But anyway, in closing here, uh, I am indeed, you know, this is me. <laughs> I am indeed the uh, resident archaeologist at the Big Lake County Historical Society's Clark May Museum. Uh, anxious, and, and it's way, 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 way. Archaeology is only a tiny part of what we have at the museum. It's just a good old, wonderful museum, all the way from the far geological, you know, fossil past, up to stuff that we can all remember nostalgic-wise, right? And everything in between. Uh, so all are invited to come, and uh, you'll all have a paper on it. <laughs> here with our contact information. You just remember that you added a new section on it. Yes, we yeah. have. 
Now, yes, we have. have already. And, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, between you and or me. <laughs> but you know, just uh, like that. There's my email. There's my cell. Anybody that you know wants. You know, because we can, you know, just, it has open hours, but, you know, we can do tours, you know, nice personal extended tours at any mutually agreeable time of, of any day that, you know, works out for folks. Uh, but anyway, uh, so let's see. Anyway, so, uh, enough said on this. Mr. Perkins. Is that the museum there? Yes, it is. Yes. That, and that's also where... Your wonderful artwork we have on display. I just, I just didn't know that was a museum. Somebody's house. It used to be a house. It used to be. It used to be a house. In fact, it was the Clark May House, which is two last names put together. But it was a home, absolutely, Mark. Anyway, uh, one more introduction before I turn it back to a secretary, Gary here. Uh, okay. I got to introduce, hello up there, Kevin, except it might be in the middle of a message. Can I say something to you, Kevin? Able to? Don't interrupt. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Kevin Coleman from the uh, Lucy Webb Hayes Heritage Center here. And we have, uh, could you start these around, please, Kevin? There, the Lucy, it's uh, in Chillicothe. And here's their tentative schedule of... Uh, schedule of uh, events for the year and here is there Mrs. Pam could you start these please there is uh, we're having archaeology day at the Lucy Ways at the Lucy house as we call it on April 27th <laughs> my wife will start those around and uh, we're also uh, for those of you that are so inclined and it's not too far, we're having at MacArthur Vinton County Archaeology Evening coming up uh, on Saturday the 23rd at 5. Start those around, uh, please, Michael. Anyway, uh, and uh, if you want uh, a nice personal tour of the Clark May, uh, my own contact information is on all three of those papers so you don't have any uh you know so you're all you know cordially invited to uh to come to the uh to come to the clark may museum please anyway i've held these folks long enough it's time to turn it back to you mr arterbright mr arterbright has something to uh just to say while we're still in session here, folks. Real quickly, Mr. Arderbright. Yeah, so, so this is our first meeting of 2024. Our April meeting is actually going to be atypical. We're going to meet on the second Saturday of April during Archaeology Day. So we are going to be sponsoring Archaeology Day at the Ross County Historical Society. I'll be sending it out in an email. If I don't have, I've just got some new people here. If I don't have your email and you can write it down on a slip of paper for me, I'll make sure you're in the loop on all of this. But that's coming up the second Saturday of April. I think it's, it's the 12th or the 13th off the top of my head. Uh, it's wonderful having some new faces here. I hope you guys will consider coming back and participating with us. Uh, we're a lively group and opinionated, and we've got a lot of good ideas, too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. 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 Thank you, Gary.